a lot of pastel painters are afraid of the dark. And by being afraid of the dark, I mean using the dark pigments to start. So why uh, is that? Why are they afraid of the dark? Well, often, you know, pastel has evolved so much over the years and it's such a versatile medium. There's so many applications. You can use so many uh, different uh, media types you can mix with it. And, um, you know, I think the, the public thinks of pastel as kind of that, that light, airy, fairy, uh, soft. Well, yeah, know, there's, so there's been, a, the media has done a good job of creating this uh, pastel colors. But of course, that's not the case at all, is it? Right. Right, it's it's the same pigment that's in oil. It's just in a dry stick form. So you can go, you know, you can do nocturnes. You can get really dark with it. Um, so I just want to demo a really dark image, a city image that um, shows how I use the darks and I wash them in with denatured alcohol to kind of make them set. Okay, well, we're going to learn all about the specifics right. in a minute. Okay. But um, I'm, I'm glad to know. We're going to focus on getting good darks in your pastel painting. And by the way, if you were watching this and you're not a pastel painter, do not ignore this segment because you're going to want to be. <laughs> I, I got to tell you that I, I have been an oil painter for 20 years and I kind of resisted pastel. But then I went to Pastel Live last year as the host and all of a sudden I got addicted and there's so many things you can do that you can't do with other mediums. So we're going to learn a little bit about that. Let's get the show started. Okay, so oh, here's wow, the And these are my four signature sets of pastels that um, Richardson Company had me select. So I have all the, I've merged them all. Blues are all together. Greens are all together yellows and uh, light values and then the reds and browns and so forth. So that's what I work with and um, what I demo with. And outstanding. My, all right. my and, and you carry all that with you when you go outdoors painting? Oh, no, no, I, I reduce it down to um, a much smaller, like 120 in my uh, plein air setup. So wow. very nice. There, my service. Okay, so I work on sanded UART paper, um, or I also make my own panels on gator board with sanded uh, pumice gesso, but this is the mounted paper, and uh, I use a, a kind of medium grade 400, and I'm ready to go. So you can see to the side the um, painting I'm going, or the photo I'm going to use for reference. I prefer to do plein air, but we're working in the studio today so we can record this so, or so that we can, you know, be on camera. So here we go. Okay. So I always start with what I call a tick mark map and it helps me determine where everything's placed, helps me get the perspective. Um, and perspective is something I really try to help people with because that's another thing um, people are a little afraid of. They, you know, if they, if they don't have a good working knowledge of perspective, it's it's hard to do convincing structures and um, cityscapes and so forth. So I always tell people to practice their drawing of perspective. So this is just my little map that is going to help me place things. This is the Chicago River. It's almost a nocturne. The sun's just headed down and we were on a little electric boat. I've done quite a number of paintings from these boat trips. So what are you using now? Are you using just, this a, dark... just a little piece of vine charcoal? Vine charcoal. Okay. Yeah. And this is telling me where I'm going to put place the darks, and then I wash them in with denatured alcohol. So you can see it's not a, a studied, um, difficult drawing. I'm, I'm essentially just tapping the pass or the uh, 
find charcoal against the sand of paper and it's picking up the charcoal, giving me the direction and the shapes that I need to go in with the darks. So I just, I use a fairly light hand because they get washed in. You, you don't want to put too much pressure on these initial darks because then it's harder to paint over them with the mid-tone values. So I'm just kind of skimming the surface. And when I wash it in, it will fill in some of these little. Now why, do, why do you wash it in? Uh, well, it, it kind of fills in the spaces. It uh, sets the, the dark pastel. So it's easy for me to go over it with the mid-range values. This is, I try to compose pieces that are three quarters dark and a quarter light or three quarters light and a quarter dark. It just makes Beautiful. it a little more interesting. Right, so you're picking something that's dominant. Yeah. If you have an equal measure of values, it's kind of a, a boring composition. Well, I have one of those going right now. A boring <laughs> yeah, you get kind of caught in the toes and, and you lose the, the drama of your composition. Not you personally, but we as artists. Yeah. Okay. And I need to... I try to... Um, Stick with, you know, the, the proper value, but change up the hue a little bit. So when I wash it in, it, it retains that hue and lets me know, you know, where things are that I've, I've placed and need to go back to. I don't want to go too light yet. I'm just, I've got to stick with the darks. That's too light. All right. <clears throat> so you like to build on top of darks. Yes, just like with oil painting. You know, you try to keep the the uh, the darks fairly transparent so you can build over them. And I always say the the lighter the value, the more pressure you can apply when you apply the pastel. I have really fallen in love with pastel painting. I didn't I, know. I, I didn't really think that I would, but it it's so so much fun. You know, it's like I, I call it adult crayons. <laughs> and except it's professional level and you know, it's so much fun because you can just pick up and start doing. You don't have to put any paint out. You don't have to do anything. Right. And you don't, I mean, you can walk away from it for several days and and you're not wasting paint that dries. Right. So, yeah. Okay. So I have my map in place. Okay. And then I use denatured alcohol with a number six fan brush. So I, a fan brush is nice because it's it's thin and it's spread out, so it gives it kind of a painterly look. And I, when I'm doing structures, I try to keep these marks vertical. Drips are fine. If things, if you get your darks over where areas are light, that's fine, because I'm still going to be able to tell where those lighter areas are. Interesting. And this is where, when I'm painting plein air and <laughs> do this, People walk away because they think I'm just really messing it up. But there's a reason for this process. Cool. How did you discover this? I was, I was just playing around with it. I, um, I always have an oil set up in my studio as well as a pastel set up. And sometimes on really large pastel paintings, I will use 
lots of turp and kind of dried up oil paint, very, very thin to lay this out. But, um, you know, I can't do that when I'm planar painting. So I, I discovered this method just by experimenting for plein air. So I just take a little bottle of alcohol with me and my fan brush and wash it in. And it denatured alcohol dries more quickly than even terps. So, um, and sometimes terps can be a little oily and there's no oil in the alcohol. So it, it seems to be the perfect. So how, how much drying time do you typically need? Uh, well, it's, this is all dry. This little guy right here is wet. So, um, I want to try to finish this painting for you while I'm doing the demo. So I just kept. So the alcohol is dry. Yeah, it just takes about five minutes. And it depends on the climate. You know, um, golly, in Texas right now, if it's so hot, it would probably dry on your brush. <laughs> yeah. And you said, did you say denatured alcohol? Denatured, yeah. It's actually a fuel. It's 99% alcohol. You can use rubbing alcohol, but it just doesn't dry quite as quickly as yeah. denatured. Yeah. What about scotch? <laughs> I suppose if you drink scotch, you could use that if you... It, it would you know, be a real waste. It would be better for your painting probably than for your belly. <laughs> <laughs> those are really really dark darks they are so those, I want... are, those are part of your set that you have with jack richardson and company yeah yeah so in my studio you know i have uh the four sets of 80 so i have 320 i hope i'm doing the math right and uh when i go out to plan our paint my setup holds about 120, so um, you know, I have to sacrifice a few. <laughs> but I just keep my pastel box for plein air ready to go in the garage and pop it in the car. We just hosted 12 artists here over the weekend to paint. The Chicago plein air painters came out and joined up with the plein air painters of Rockford, and we painted in our yard and downtown and at the gardens yeah. nearby. So it was really great. So you're going over your darks and restating them. I am, yeah, just kind of reinforcing them because they, they did get, you know, washed in and diminished. So what is the advantage to putting the alcohol down versus just leaving the darks that you had laid in before? Well, it it kind of makes a more cohesive surface. You know, when I just put them in initially, there were some spots um, due to the, the sanded paper, but you need to use sanded paper just to grab the, the pastels. Um, you know, otherwise they could kind of over time fall away and uh, you could lose some of that pigment and it would get, you know, you have to put glass over a pastel and it would get behind the glass between, you know, your image and uh, your frame around the glass. So I don't use a fixative, but I do kind of set the pastel with the alcohol initially. And you're, it looks like you're mostly using the side. I do. I use the, the sticks like a brush. I take the papers off always and oops, <laughs> knocking this around and things are coming apart. Um, I wish the manufacturers would just make them without the papers on them. Yeah. But some people are so organized, you know, they want to know color number, name. They make like little catalogs and keep track. And, uh, that's not me. <laughs> I don't do that. Me neither. <laughs> So 
So I tried to, you know, use some cooler tones on these bridges that are a little bit more in the distance, just, you know, for atmospheric perspective. Um, Would you explain that term to the people who might not know sure, what that is? Sure. There's, um, you know, atmosphere or air between you and what is in the distance. So your uh, values and hues become more subtle, a little more subdued. So, um, and, you know, there's more light between you and what's in the distance. So it, it's just everything is... Um, diminished and softer in color and value. If you if you put a real intense dark in the distance, it's going to pop forward. So you have to be careful about that. Right. And so things go bluer, yellow dissipates right. as things go further away. Right. I'm going to start putting some of the mid range values in now. Very noisy medium. <laughs> well, my tape has, has failed me. So it's, this is bouncing, but yeah, there's a lot of scratching. Yep. Because of the tape came off paper. again. You need to get the staple oh. gun out. <laughs> Oh, well. And, you know, the beauty of pastel is you can layer the color. If you don't quite have the right color, you can layer the pastels to make the color you need. Nice, yeah. Just you know, I was out Saturday with 120 colors and I didn't have some of the colors I needed. So I had to just keep layering. Well, that's good practice. Yeah. But because you're not mixing like you do with oil paint, it's just a faster medium. You get, you know, quicker results. Because hopefully- Yeah, you, you never really stop and think about how much time you spend mixing. Yeah. And, you know, you can, I tell students just to hold a stick, a pastel stick up to a color they're trying to match. And that's a good way to determine if you've picked up the right color. Because, you know, your pastels can get dirty with use. And um, sometimes they kind of all look the same until you clean them. And I do use some hards uh, if I need to get into a tight spot. So I just need to get a little, a little line in here. And they, they almost like act like a shovel to get some of the, the pastel, soft pastel out of the way to put another color on top. Because they're, you know, little hard squares. You do most of your plein air work with pastel? I do. You know, I grew up as an oil painter and painted for years with oil, uh, plein air. And I've just found this is so rapid that I'm just using pretty much uh, the pastel now for plein air. And you know, part of the reason it's so rapid is because I'm not mixing paint. Picking up the color I want and run, running with it. That's too intense for back there.
So um, I like to think about, you know, the negative spaces when I'm painting too. And I, I paint a lot of L's, the, you know, the L, L tracks in Chicago. Yeah. Um, and I think of them as calligraphy in the sky. Interesting. Okay, so starting to get into some of the negative shapes, spaces here. Okay, so often the sky in a city is a little more yellow because of all the vehicles polluting the air. So I like to do yellow skies in the city. Oh, wow. When it gets that dark, it really pops. Yeah. And there's a wonderful glow under this bridge that's kind of an orange glow. I don't know if you can see it on camera. I see photo, it. But yeah. Clean that up a little. Sometimes that underpainting can become shapes that that you want to leave in the distance. So I need to add a little more orange here. Well, it really does come together fast. <laughs> okay, then there's some other things that need attention back in the darks. You know, I'm just thinking about shape and suggesting structures. I'm not obsessing over how many windows are there, right. um, the exact shape. I just want to get the feel for the light and a sense of, of the bridges without being too accurate, especially with a quick demo. Ken Oster always talked about the, the candy that he would add at the end. And yeah. I think of these little bits of light as the candy. Thank you. 
again, I'm using the side and yep. a sideways stroke instead of, you know, using the tip. So instead of calling this brush strokes, as you do in oil painting, you want to vary your mark making. So instead of that term brush stroke, we use the term mark making for pastel. And people seem to develop their own signature marks. So you can look at a pastelist's work and kind of identify who has done the painting just by their mark making which is kind of fun. Yeah. It is fun. Okay, where did that one go? Lost the yellow I was using. <laughs> but did it drop it to the floor? <laughs> no, no, it just dropped into my box and I couldn't find it. So I'm going back over the darks a little bit, just adding other hues to make those darks more interesting. Light reflected under the bridge, and I want to be careful not to get it too light in value. It looked like you added more glow to those oh, okay. distant buildings. And I did, yeah, I put those buildings in to the to the right. So again, when doing um, multi-windowed buildings, like you know you see in cities, I let the underpainting kind of define those windows, and then I just will put a lighter value over the top, and I don't, you know, meticulously draw in those windows. Um, the, you know, there's just no need to do that unless you're doing a commission of someone, someone's office building and they need to know, you know, exactly yeah. where their office is located on the facade. <laughs> you know, it's just not important to get all those windows in there. You just want to suggest. So painting the negative space. Letting some of the underpainting show through. So there's a, that blue building behind, so I need to get some blue in here. Or that reads like Chicago to me. <laughs> well, good. What do you do about dust? Do you just let it fall to the easel? Do you have some collection? Yeah, system? it's. I've got a little bit of uh, paper, like paper towels under here that are catching a lot of it. You know, outside it doesn't matter. Uh, you never want to blow on your pastels, whether you're in your studio. I mean, outside would be okay, but um, especially if you're in a classroom situation, uh, you certainly don't want to. Well, oh, because you don't want to be inhaling that in your lungs. Right, right. That should be not through there. So, you know, painting the negative space gives a sense of space and um, a sense of those buildings that are back there without being a slave to drawing those buildings in. 
A reminder to you guys that if you leave a comment, tell me where you're from. Uh, we would love to grab somebody from the comments and give away a copy of my book, Make More Money Selling Your Art. And you can get it by just leaving a comment. And if we pick you, you're the winner. Yay. Yay. I love seeing all these international audiences and people all over the United States watching. It's so much fun. That is so amazing, you know, that we all got connected when we couldn't be physically connected. Yep. And we're staying connected. You're right. I'm glad it's still part of our lives. Okay, I want to get some water in there so people know there's a river. We should do St. Patrick's Day and make it green. <laughs> yeah, all right. Changes color as it gets close to the to the bank. It's in shadow there. Or I could watch this all day. <laughs> I guess I'll get a chance at Pastel Live because it's four yeah. days, four days of watching greats like you do this. Yeah, looking forward to, to Pastel Live. It's always fun to do those events. It's it's also fun to see how everybody approaches it. Not everybody does it the same way you do. And you know, some people are doing really loose impressionistic things, other are doing really tightly rendered portraits. And so there's just so many different approaches. That's what makes the world go around. Is that what <laughs> it does it? Keeps, you know, the art world interesting to just see how differently people work. Yeah, absolutely. So is your uh, paper, is it on a board? Yes, I have a frame shop, so I have a dry mount press so I can mount this paper. Um, and I usually mount to gator board. Now, when you moved out of Chicago, did you move your frame shop? I did. Wow. 30 years of accumulated stuff to move, that probably was fun. Yeah, right. <laughs> I think we used 10 U-Hauls <laughs> oh <my. laughs> to get here. <laughs> but it's worth it. We love it, love it, love it. How long were you in Chicago? 34. Wow. And had the, the shop in Lincoln Park for 19 years. Yeah, well, all those people are going to have to come to Rockford now. Yeah, they have been coming. That's good. Painters and collectors, it's been so wonderful. And I'm so happy there's a plein air group here that has formed in Rockford. So we need them everywhere. Yeah. So I don't even know I'm doing it, but I I put a stroke down and then I tend to soften the the edge with my finger. 
I noticed that. It's amazing you have any fingerprints left. I know. Could my side job could be bank robber, I think, because of my fingerprints <laughs> are gone. <laughs> I don't think I'd like that very yeah, much. I don't think I would either. Too much pressure, too much yeah. tension. Take too much time away from painting. That's right. So I'm at the point where I just need to clean things up, you know, because I've just established where everything goes and gotten the shapes in. Uh, certainly have the darks in. And I just need to tweak it a little bit. Okay. Uh, overall. All right. Well, I'll be curious what you do to tweak. Yeah. Just clean up some of these lines. So I'm so glad to hear you're painting in pastel occasionally. You know what surprised me? Uh, I, I had tried it once before, before Pastel Live, and I just, it was really awful. Uh, if, <laughs> I, you, if you remember, you gave me a set I of your pastels. Did. I did. And some paper. And uh, so I, I tried it right after that, and I just had a failure, miserable failure. But after watching Pastel Live last summer, and, and when I picked them up, the first one I did was kind of a dog. But after that, it was kind of like, wow, I'm actually surprised I got this good. And I, I think a lot of the stuff just kind of comes through osmosis when you watch, you know, 40 hours of content. Right. It just, it sticks with you. Now, do you ever spray your pastels? No, I don't. Um, you know, because I have a frame shop, I have the luxury of putting them right into a frame. So, um, you know, spray really will dull the pastel. And That's then you have I've to kind of repaint. So, yeah, I just don't do that at all. Well, I think what we're going to do, Nancy, I know you're going to do some fine tuning, but we're going to wrap it up here. Okay. Why don't you come back on camera so everybody can meet you? All right. In case they tuned in late. My mouse will never be the same with this dirty hand I have. <laughs> Our guest today is Nancy King Mertz, and what a fabulous pastel painter she is. And she's going to be part of the instructors at Pastel Live. Um, what are you thinking about doing at Pastel Live? Uh, I'll be talking about perspective, but that's my, that's what I preach all the time. Well, that's um, important. Yeah, both atmospheric and linear perspective. Okay. Um, so that, that's my shtick. All right. Well, terrific. Nancy, thank you so much for being here today. I really appreciate you taking the time and we will see you at Pastel Live, and, and hopefully we'll get a chance to catch up there. I know everybody gets a chance to have their answers, quest, their questions answered in the chat uh, while your demo is going on. So that's going to be a great opportunity to connect. Great. Thank you so right. much. Jerry. Thank Bye. you, Nancy. Have you ever wondered how some artists get such realistic quality in their work? You know, unbelievably beautiful portraits, stunning figures, and realistic looking still lifes or florals? Painting or drawing realism takes your work to a whole new level. Whether you want tight, carefully rendered realistic paintings, or looser, more impressionistic realism, most high level artists will tell you that painting is a skill that anyone can learn. If you follow a process, you can paint beautiful, realistic artwork. But where do you learn? You could spend $3,000 or more to attend a live workshop or convention. Or you can learn from the world's finest realists from home for a fraction of the cost. 
At Realism Live, the world's first virtual online realism conference, you'll get three days of world-class artists demonstrating their techniques and processes. This is a comprehensive conference covering all the subjects you want to learn in portraiture, figures, landscapes, still life, cityscapes, color mixing, and more. Taught by the world's leading artists. Not only will you learn their techniques, you'll have a chance to interact with instructors and get your questions answered. And you'll get to know other artists personally through our breakout sessions. And we'll even paint and draw together at the end of each day. Make new friends in our breakout sessions. Paint with hundreds of others. Get private access to our exclusive members group to become a part of our community and learn to take your artwork to a higher level. Realism Live is three full days of painting and drawing instruction, November 10th through 12th. And for people who want to learn painting and drawing from scratch, start with our Beginner's Day one day atelier on November 9th. Soon you'll be painting faces, people, flowers, scenery, objects, and other subjects. You'll see your artwork improve faster as you learn from top artists and instructors from all over the world. Sign up today and join the world as we learn art together from these amazing artists. Glenn Vilpu, John Potoshenek, Alex Kelly, Ned Mueller, Terry Strickland, Dustin Van Welchel, Lisa Egwe, Clyde Aspavig, Sarah Sedwick, Rose Franson, Chuck Morris, Michelle Dunaway, Michael Mittler, Daniel Graves, Leona Shanks, Alexander Shanks, Juliet Aristides, Carol Peebles, Todd M. Casey, Cornelia Hernes, Sandra Angelo, Oliver Sin, Sharon Sprung, Mario Robinson, and Deborah Hughes. And it's hosted by fine art connoisseur and publisher Eric Rhodes and editor-in-chief Peter Trippi. And if you can't watch live, you can watch replays on your own time for up to a year. And it's 100% guaranteed. You'll be pleasantly surprised to realize just how much you can learn in such a short time. Realism Live. From the publishers of Fine Art Connoisseur Magazine. Sign up today to reserve your seat now.